the spirit of gentleness that Paul talks about in Galatians 6, and that has really kind of led us into kind of like the series that I'm going to be doing, I have been doing, and I continue to do about the fruit of the Spirit. And inter- I think it's an interesting way to look at the fruit, and then an Old Testament kind of character that they kind of go together. So when we looked at the spirit of meekness, we looked at Moses. Uh, last week we were looking at love, so we looked at Naomi and Ruth. So this week, uh, I'm just, I'm just kind of going in order of the way Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. The next fruit that he lists is joy, and we're going to be spending a little bit of time with David from the Old Testament. Just to make it clear, this is not a big extensive kind of thing about the joy of the Lord, because it is, it is an extensive subject. The last time that I preached on the joy of the Lord, actually it was the last message that I preached in Swanage, we had gone back for a visit, and I ended up preaching about the joy of the Lord, and everybody's like, oh, the joy of the Lord, yes, we're going to dance and sing. No, Paul talks about his joy as the people of God. If you read through the epistles, you'll see him constantly referring to people and saying, you are my joy. You are my joy. So Paul takes it. There's, there's a lot of different ways of looking at the joy of the Lord. So this is not extensive. It's just looking at the joy that Paul's talking about and then looking at David a little bit. The actual Greek word, kara, C-H-E, A-R-A, may come as kind of like a surprise, especially to a bunch of Pentecostals, Charismatics, whatever. That word refers to an internal calm, delight, a type of cheerfulness and happiness that we have inside that usually is expressed in a visible way. That could be, any, that could be a smile. It could be a nod of a head. It could be a type of rejoicing that a lot of us have been involved with for years where there's dancing and singing and clapping hands. That could be the way we decide to express that feeling that we have within. So it's an interesting kind of fruit that Paul's referring to. Jesus in Matthew 25, remember the parable of the talents, in the end he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been found faithful in a few things, therefore you're going to be rewarded. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So Jesus expresses the joy of the Lord in some kind of a futuristic context, that at the end of the road, we'll be entering into something greater than the dimension that we know now when it comes to joy. But again, he's not saying you're going to end up in a dance hall someplace, dancing up and down and screaming and banging drums and all that, which it's a good way of expressing kind of like, that's all right, that's good. But that's not exactly what he's saying. What he's saying is something more along these lines. Right now, it is really difficult to maintain a kind of a constant, calm delight, happiness, cheerfulness in every situation. Maybe by the time you finish worshiping on a Sunday morning, you're there. Maybe in the morning if you pray, and you, you end up there. But trying to maintain that throughout the day is a bit difficult. And he's saying there's going to come a time where you're going to enter into a realm where that is your constant all the time. And by the way, he says in John, John 15, 16, and 17, seven times he talks about imparting that joy now. So you don't have to look like a lot of people do, well, someday. Well, the someday is true. But today is a someday. Today is a day that he said, my joy I give you now. I'm giving you my joy now. You don't have to wait to enter into that ultimate at the end of the parable. You can experience that today and now because I'm giving it to you. It's like I give you five bucks, you got it. You got the five bucks. You don't have to wait to be paid later on or something. So he talks about this joy in a couple different ways. There's a fuller expression, but for now, until we enter into that fuller expression, we, we have a, an ongoing daily expression of it right now. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about a little bit today. Paul, when he introduces the nature of the kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, that's, that's uh, pitted against, when you read Romans 12, 13, 14, he's pitting that against being so moved by external circumstances. The kingdom of God is not food. It's not what you drink. I know we'd like it to be. We'd like this is that, no, that is, that, that's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So Paul's talking about something that defies the external, so to speak. It's not moved by the external. I might say right now, right off the bat, this is not going to be a difficult message, but it is in some respects as, as it unfolds. Because I think that every one of us in here is moved by situations and circumstances. And we get in moods and we say and we do things because we're moved by the things around us. Our Father in Heaven does not put us down for that. He lifts us up and says, you don't have to be. Because what I've given you is a calm delight that's inside you, the fruit of the Spirit. I've given it to you. It's in you. It's already there. 
I mean, you can even pray for it if you want, but it's almost like praying for something you've already got. It kind of doesn't really make a lot of sense. Why not just exercise what you already have, and you can, if you believe it. I mean, it takes a lot of faith to believe that. So, this idea of kara is not necessarily jumping up and down and singing. And I mean, that falls into the category of rejoicing, and we might rejoice when we have that feeling of kara, so to speak, because it does express itself outwardly, whether it's our body, our words. It has some kind of a manifestation. Luke's Beatitudes, when he talks about persecution, where in Matthew, Jesus says, Rejoice and be, you know, blessed are those who are persecuted, and so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. That's the way it's worded over in Matthew. Luke, what Luke talks about in his parallel kind of Beatitudes, what he says is rejoice, be glad, and he actually says leap for joy. There's a lot going on in that whole context of this thing about joy. I want to just lay the foundation immediately for what we're going to look at in David. You might remember the story of Hannah in 1 Samuel where she was barren and then God gave her Samuel. She sings, we call it Hannah's song, and she opens her song with, My heart rejoices in the Lord. She's talking about an activity of the heart that's taking place. And you can parallel, you know, Mary in the New Testament, Mary's song when she sings, you know, before Elizabeth and everything. And she says the same kind of thing. She said, my spirit has rejoiced. Both of those songs will be based on something that happened. Now that is kind of like the Old Testament idea of rejoicing and joy. Something happened and now I'm rejoicing. Instead of like Paul says, well actually you can rejoice always in the Lord. Your joy is not based on the things that are going on. Rejoice in the Lord always. He goes on in the same chapter to talk about being content in whatever state he finds himself. Things are going good, that's great. Things are going bad, that's not so great. But it doesn't move me. Those things are not going to dictate the joy that I already have. There is a definite New Testament, Old Testament view. What we're kind of saying is in the Old Testament, we all have human spirits. Everybody in this room does. We all have human spirits that tend to be prompted to rejoice to do certain things, to express the joy that we've got in us based on an external prompting. That's the way it works for our human spirit. And if things aren't going well around us, our human spirit ex expresses it in a different way. It reflects what's going on instead of who he is. Jesus comes along, Paul comes along and says, no, I've got a joy for you, the joy of the spirit that's resident in you all the time. That's not to say, say that we don't react and respond to situations, but it doesn't tell us when and how we're going to rejoice. The joy of the Lord is in us. It's a fruit of the Spirit that is in us that God chose to be that way. There's a lot of different, I mean, it's a huge subject. You can look at, uh, for instance, when Moses is having his talk with God at the burning bush, and he's not quite signing on the dotted line yet, and finally it says God got angry. And he says, so I'll bring your brother, the two of you can work this thing out together, whatever. But he says, your brother's coming this way, and when he sees you, he's going to be glad in his heart. Again, glad in his heart. There's this expression that's used a lot about being glad in the heart. This is the day the Lord has made. We will be glad and rejoice. There's different things, the gladness of the heart and the rejoicing. So Old Testament, New Testament, the indication seems to be Old Testament is responding with joy when the situation presents itself. The New Testament, the, the uh, Jesus, Paul, Holy Spirit, is based on his word. Simply that, my joy I give to you. These words I've spoken to you so that my joy might remain in you. So it, it kind of works to, for me. I, I might just put it in this kind of context. This is the way I process it. The joy is there, and if I believe God for what he said, who he said he is, what he's going to do, why, he, if I'm in faith on the thing, if I'm in faith, then that word of faith in me with that joy causes me to maybe even act contrary to a situation. You know, somebody says, you know, what are you rejoicing about? But I am rejoicing that I've got a heavenly father who knows before this ever happened. And he has a people on this planet called the church that are actively praying and involved and bringing the light into dark situations and praying for those who are in bondage. I can rejoice in that because that's true and it's fact and it's faith and it's all those different things. Remember when Jesus is teaching the parable of the sower 
There's a lot of different conditions where the seed falls. We won't go through the parable, but there's one particular condition that he calls stony places. Remember that? The seed falls on stony places. The stony place, he says it's a place where the seed is received with joy, which is a nice way of saying the human spirit says, hey, this is great. Now I can rejoice. I've got something to be joyful about. But he says, but the seed doesn't have any root because it's a stony place. It doesn't really take root in what? It doesn't take root in God. And he says, therefore, when trials and tribulations, when external things start to happen, they're moved, they're pushed around all over the place. They're moaning, they're complaining, they got all kinds of, oh, oh, it's me. And he says, you know, and that's just the way it goes. And therefore, it doesn't bear fruit. It doesn't bear fruit. There's fruit there to bear, but it doesn't bear it because it's being pushed around by too many things. That there is a joy that we manifest within ourselves, and there's a joy that God gives us. So, Jesus talked about this. One of the toughest scriptures in the Old Testament. They're on the edge of the promised land. They're on, the, and this is for a lot of us, by the way. You say, well, that's thousands. Of, no, this is for a lot of us. We're on the edge of something. something. We haven't entered into it yet, but we're on the edge of it. We're on the edge of entering into something of God that he has promised. That he said it's there, but you've got to go in and, and take it. That's the way it works. That is as now a message as you're ever going to hear. You're on the edge of something, but you've got to go in. And what it says, Moses starts to talk to them on the edge of the promised land about the blessings that are upon them and the curses that can come upon them if they reject the blessings. It's kind of like simple. Blessings are associated with obedience. Curses are associated with disobedience. Don't leave the house. There's a crazy man out on the street that's mugging people. So I leave the house. Thank you very much. And then I blame God that I got beat up. But I told you. See, and then we look at, yeah, God made the crazy man. No, no, no. God told you this is the way it is. If you listen to me, like children are supposed to, children obey your parents. If you obey your parents, good things happen. If you disobey, disobey the warnings, bad things happen. It's kind of, it's like so simple, it's ridiculous. Even children can understand this. <laughs>